Um, we wanted to welcome Ian Roy to our Makerspaces and Libraries tour for October. I'm just going to read you a little bit about Ian's bio and then we'll get started. Um, so Ian Roy is the director of for Research Technology and Innovation in Brandeis University's library. He's also the founding head of the Brandeis Maker Lab and an adjunct professor in the Brandeis International Business School. He works with researchers to overcome the technological hurdles they encounter in their workflows, top to bottom, and is cons consistently running local pilots and new technologies to address their needs. His work touches on desktop, laptop, server break fix, instrument machine support, digital forensics and security tools, institutional storage of big data, cloud collaboration and backup in a big data context, and many of the new tool sets in the maker community, including support of touch and gesture inputs, multiple displays, VR head mounted displays, digital fabrication, 3D scanning robotics, drones and embedded systems. He specializes in not only the technological aspects, but also the policy and political political implications of implementing emerging technologies on campus, which is exciting. Ian was the project lead in developing both the research technology department and the Maker Lab at Brandeis. And so that's that. And with that, Ian, go ahead, take the lead. Uh, thank you so much, Erica. We're super excited to show off our spaces today. So we're going to start in the Maker Lab, which we opened in 2014. So we're starting our fifth academic year. And then we're going to go downstairs to Tim. Uh, Tim Hebert is our embedded systems and electronic specialist in the library. So he's a full-time library staff who does prototyping of electronics. We call him a robot surgeon in the library. And he's gonna show you his new automation lab that he built all summer, and we just opened that in the last month. And then the third space we'll go to is our digital humanities lab, which was founded in the classics department here, and uh, has transitioned into the library group where we're stewarding it during a refresh and opening it up to humanities, social sciences, researchers, anyone who wants to use the space. And we'll show you it's in the middle of an upgrade. So we'll start here in our Maker Lab. And I wanted to give a little bit of context. So th this is the room. This was empty in 2014. and has built out over the last four years. And we're in uh, the Farber Mezzanine. So this is sort of the living room of the university. And there's a Starbucks below us. So it's a, uh, every seat is used when classes are in session. Today is actually a brand nice holiday. So uh, there are less students around than when classes are in session. So this space uh, was our only space for the first couple of years, and now has specialized more in digital fabrication. So on this side of the room, we have a bank of 3D printers where anyone can just walk up and use them. So our access model is a little different than most makerspaces we see. You can't send us a file and the file comes out. Instead, you can rent a machine and rent a human to sit with you at the machine, but it's up to you to run the whole process. And part of that, we want everyone to be a designer and a technician. You see some places where the designer is on a pedestal and the technician is somewhere below that. And we want everyone to own their whole work from beginning to end. So we really encourage people to get under the hood, modify the machines, and uh, print in weird materials also. Uh, and back here, we have a lot more machine diversity. So the 3D printing club owns all of this gear. Brandeis has an interesting model where 1% of tuition goes to a fund where students allocate it to other students. And all of our clubs are, found, are funded that way. Some of our sports teams are found, funded that way. Our 3D printing club was founded through that system. So all of this is student-owned gear that we garage, and we garage equipment for a lot of different groups. So they really get under the hood and modify their stuff. We have some weird printers like the Rova, the Five Head. Uh, we have a Morgan that uses a SCAR-type system, so not a Delta or a Cartesian robot. Uh, and a lot of these are heavily modified, and we have specialty filaments down here for the metals and the woods and the flexible teeth. Petroleum products, we don't do ABS or resins, uh, mainly because there's a million books in the building and we don't have adequate ventilation or a sink. Uh, to get access here, we ask that you take a training in one machine, any type of machine. We offer a weekly trainings on Friday. Uh, our third staff member, other than me and Tim, who isn't here, is H. Hazal Uzankaya, who is our research technology specialist. She builds VR environments and does brain-computer interface. She has a neuroscience background. And she also runs our weekly 3D printing training. So uh, you can come in here, spend two hours, learn how the machine works, and then it's up to you to demonstrate that you're co competent. So you have to produce an object, and there's a checklist. After that, you sign a contract with basically the rules on this poster behind me. And our biggest rules are, uh, 
There are only three things you aren't allowed to make here, weapons, drug paraphernalia, and other offensive items. Offensive items are case by case. If someone complains about it, we try to figure out how that happened. Another big rule is it's a self-cleaning room, which means you clean it yourself. So we expect people to leave it in a nice condition when they're done. The only card access issues we've ever had are around tidiness of the space. And then once you sign a contract and do your checklist, you can get card swipe into the door. So this room is available whenever the building is open, which a lot of the time is until 2 a.m. or 24 hours. But there's not necessarily staff here, even in the nine to five block. Uh, if you reach out and I get like 24 hours in advance, we'll try to put someone here. There are 12 student workers on our team. Uh, but anyone can walk in whenever they want, and it's up to you if you prop the door open or not. So right now, uh, River is here printing some aircraft. One of, uh, what's your role with Aviation Club? I am the vice president. And they, run, they fly real aircraft at uh, the local Air Force Base, but they also have a flight simulator set up in here uh, where they fly the aircraft in simulation. And just this semester, uh, drones are banned locally, but they have a, a weekly drone practice on Tuesday afternoons where we have an off-campus venue we've partnered with. So we're doing that every Tuesday through December, trying to train up some local pilots. Uh, there's also a prosthesis club where we do the enable hands. Uh, they're a super active group on campus that fits into the Brandeis culture of like social activism and making for good. We have a make to mend kind of motto here where we try to repair the world in some way. So they've made a bunch of enable hands and they made their first three for children and sent them off last year. And this year they have two more clients uh, that they're building them for. One who's doing just a single finger cap with the glove, so modified off the standard platform, and one that needs to run from the elbow. So our first one that goes above the wrist. So they'll probably be working on that most of the fall semester and deliver that in the spring. Uh, we also haven't thrown away any plastic at all since we started. So we have over 100 kilograms in storage, and we have some reclaiming machines. It's really difficult to remake filament in a useful way, so we also have partnered with a company in Massachusetts that makes toner plastics. And uh, Replay 3D is uh, a startup out of there that will take your plastic and re-spool it as black. Uh, for about the same cost as buying a fresh spool of black. At the front, we have a bunch of example objects that were all made in this room, except for the full color process. So we do have a couple instruments in other labs on campus that have adequate ventilation or a space. And one of them is a binder jet that does a uh, full color powder-based 3D printing. So lays down powder and glue and uses an HP inkjet cartridge to get full color. Uh, that started off as mainly a resource to do molecules with, but more and more, we're doing statues of people and ancient objects and other things that people want color on. Our basic model is, if you want to get involved, email MakerLab at Brandeis. Uh, we are in the library system for all our training, so you can book that the same way you'd book any other workshop in the library. Uh, and I wanted to show you an example of sort of a, the kind of ethos we have here. So we started with Creator X's as our main walk-up printer, because you can bang on them really hard, and they're fairly robust, and they do a lot of different materials, uh, dual material. And then uh, we got the Prusas because we really like how stable they are to maintain. We have over 100 3D printers in the library. About 40 or 50 are working any day. And across that, we probably have 40 or 50 different hardware vendors. So we have huge machine diversity here. Uh, our newest upgrade this summer, we bought a dozen of these CR10s. And these are cheap. You can get them in China for about $350 to $400. And it's a very stable gantry system, but they come with not such a great hot end. So this summer, uh, Tim and H and I worked with some, some student modify the first one of these, where we put Marlin firmware on here. So if I reboot one, uh, it will show, oops, all right, actually let it turn all the way off. So this will show, it has our nice little logo, and it's running Marlin. And so uh, we modified it with an E3D uh, Titan hot end, so like a really high end hot end for a hundred bucks. So 350 plus 100, you're still under $500 of material. And you have a 15 inch tall build volume that's super quality, has direct drive, and can do flexible materials. So this is kind of a hack to get a super cheap printer. And uh, Tim will talk about this more, but we have guides for all this. We're doing a Dazuki guide. So uh, brandeismakerlab.dazuki.com has the open source, like how to get the hardware, get the software, all the tools you need, step by step, like instructable, how to build that. So we were just at Maker Faire in New York, and that was one of the things we were sharing with anyone else who wants to do it. So we built the first one as staff, and then we had student workers this summer who built 11 more. So we sort of wrote a Google Doc guide, handed it off as a proof of concept, they made it work, and then they did 11 more and created that Dazuki guide that was more shareable. 
So we leverage our student effort a lot. Uh, since we founded this room, when we founded, there was one technology club on campus, uh, Bitmap, which is sort of an umbrella Brandeis undergraduate technology group. And now that's grown, there's like almost a dozen clubs that use our spaces. So we helped a, a virtual reality club found, a prosthesis club. The aviation club was resurrected and started doing more simulator and drones. Uh, there's a plastic recycling club. Uh, and there's a robotics club Tim will talk about downstairs. And a couple other ones that are just starting up and aren't chartered or funded yet. Uh, so this is sort of our first space. And now we're going to cut over to Tim in the robotics lab downstairs. And I'm going to meet you guys after that in the digital humanities lab. Hello, everybody. I am Tim, who Ian was just mentioning. And we also have here uh, Daniel, one of our student workers. So let's give you a tour around the uh, hard to selfie with a uh, laptop. Sorry about that. So uh, this is the automation lab. If we just go out here, we can give you some context as to where everything is. So right upstairs there is the maker lab. If we come around here, this is more uh, study area for the library. Come into here and this is our automation lab. So first thing you get uh, right here on the entryway to the door is our cabinet and the whole idea of the automation lab here is similar mindset to the maker lab upstairs where you do uh, rapid prototyping of physical objects with digital fabrication. And here we do rapid prototyping of electronic objects. So we've got a whole host of different sensors, Arduinos, uh, Raspberry Pis, various things like that so that students, faculty, staff, whoever, Brandeis community member can come in. They don't need any sort of real background in electronics or um, fabrication of any kind really and they can you know, get started on their research project or try some neat electronic project. And we've got this whole cabinet here, let's open that up, where they can rent parts from. So a lot of times when you're dealing with robotics and electronics, I wish I had a wider angle lens here so you guys can see a little better. There we go. Um, so anytime you uh, deal with any sort of robotics or electronic stuff like that, you'll run into these odd gotchas there are certain scenarios of a particular sensor does really well in one situation and very poorly in a different situation or has certain specifications that you weren't quite aware of. And, you know, they show up on paper, but they don't really uh, mean anything until you've got them in your hands. So that's why we've got this kind of area for people to uh, interact with all of these. And as Ian had mentioned a little bit earlier, we might have been prior to recording, but our whole model here is open source. So all of the stuff that we're doing, all of the uh, these sensors and things we're writing up guides for so that people know how to plug everything in, their sample code, all of that good stuff. We have um, what's called Dazuki. It's the same group that runs iFixit. And so we have our own BrandeisMakerLab.Dazuki. And uh, all of these will be in there. So feel free to use any of that stuff as well for yourselves. And then if we continue on with our little tour here. So over here is just a drop-in station. Uh, currently it is set up for one of our projects from the robotics club. Um, they are doing, sorry, not great at holding this laptop. Uh, they are doing these little mini sumo bots. And the whole idea of these is they are combat robotics, except instead of trying to smash into each other, they try and push each other out of this ring. Um, and so the robotics club is working on all kinds of different software stuff and various designs. And what we'd like to end up advancing that into is a bunch of low cost versions of these with just the bare minimum versions of sensors that are needed so that they can do parallel uh, evolutionary algorithm learning stuff. Uh, we've got a little printer in here. Obviously the majority of our printer stuff is done upstairs, but this is need to rapid prototype something really quick and just get a, a robot part off. We've got two drop-in soldering stations right over by the whiteboard. Um, this room we do, like upstairs, you take your training for soldering or sorry, you're training for 3D printing to be able to get card access to the room. With this room, you get uh, soldering training to get access. Make sure that any of the actual like dangerous hot equipment, you understand the safety implications of and you know how to use properly. Uh, not gonna get yourself in too much trouble being in this kind of room. Uh, over here, we've got various parts bins. So resistors, capacitors, transistors, diodes, inductors, all that good stuff uh, for building circuits and whatever other gear you might need. Uh, this TV here, we just have as a drop-in station, it's currently hooked up to a Raspberry Pi that Daniel is working on, which I will lead to our next thing, um, is this donkey car is one of our uh, projects that we've been working on lately. 
That is a self-driving, this is an open source project for a self-driving car. And what you do is drive around on a track over and over again. And what it does is actually take pictures along with your steering angle and your throttle position as the human drives it. And then you feed all of that content into uh, TensorFlow, which is the same exact algorithm that Google's using to predict search results, um, give you good YouTube video recommendations, all that kind of good stuff. And it will then create a model that tries to represent what the human would do in any given scenario. So then now you can have it go out on that same track and it will drive itself around the track. Um, the way that we intend on training this kind of stuff, this is, is a microcosm to show, sure, we've got a bot that drives in a circle, but really this same algorithm, this same technology can be used for uh, text analysis. It can be used for all kinds of good stuff. So this is really just to, to spark interest in students. Um, that leads us next to what Daniel's working on here, how we're planning on training some of this stuff. This is a uh, server rack for what will be our Raspberry Pi supercomputer. So over here in the back, we've got a server rack and that will end up being, um, it'll have a Raspberry Pi supercomputer and a little commodity cluster. Now, realistically, the supercomputer made out of Raspberry Pis. Raspberry Pis are these, for those of you who don't know these little guys. So this is a little miniature computer. Um, it'll run a full operating system. It'll run actual Linux. You can play Minecraft or browse the internet or do whatever on it. Um, and they are very inexpensive. They're, I think, 30 to $35, depending on the model. And actually, Daniel has one up right now. So that is actually running Raspberry Pi. You've got a mouse and a keyboard and all that good stuff. So yeah, we'll have a whole bunch of those stacked up. And those will live over in our server rack. And that's not going to be terrifically powerful, but the interesting part is while we do have a real supercomputer on campus, um, it's being used for like protein folding actual research. And you can't just go rip a node out of that and see how it fails over because people are doing proper research with that. However, um, with this one, a student could actually come in and turn one off and see how the thing fails over, all kinds of good stuff, push different uh, software to it, whatever they're trying to do. Um, so yeah, and I think that is actually a pretty good segue back to Ian in the Digital Humanities Lab. Excellent, thank you, Tim. And uh, I'm in here with Helen, our student manager of the space. And this, uh, we're gonna revamp this. Let me get you an angle. So this is the space. So we have about 1,200 square feet of maker space in the library, but it's, it's extremely discontinuous. Uh, we do about three miles on the Fitbit indoors in the library every day, going between them. Uh, so this room, uh, we are refreshing with a bunch of new computers. Uh, you might notice that we have seven different types of tables in here. So we're buying some furniture and some new computation equipment. And the hope is for the first year, uh, we're gonna push on creating high quality 3D models of objects and landscapes and also lead to some text analysis using the machines, uh, some TEI work, and then uh, some residue analysis. Uh, there is a chemistry lab where they do residue on campus. And we've put out a bunch of prints to look at while we're in here. Uh, the active projects in here are mostly archaeology facing projects, but we're going to be doing more GIS, more TEI type stuff. There's also a workstation for the Homer multi-text project. Uh, and I wanted to highlight a couple projects while we were in here. So, uh, one of the first things that we were really successful in with coursework and research was uh, 3D printing biomolecules. So we had a student, Eduardo Beltrame, uh, who was a, an undergraduate studying biophysics, biochemistry, who was really interested in molecules and walked into the lab saying, 3D printing is science fiction, but I want to make some molecules. And he created an original workflow for rendering molecules, and he 3D printed over 100 molecules that had never been printed on low-cost machines before. And he shared them back out to the NIH's 3D print exchange. Uh, the NIH brought him to the National Science Fair, where he exhibited with them. And uh, he met the folks from Jove, the Journal of Visual Experimentation. And as a senior undergraduate, he was first author on a protocol for how to do this. So there's an, a video that's 10 minutes long that shows you how to take a data set from the protein data bank, uh, set the visualization characteristics on a molecular visualizer like PyMol or Chimera, output it, clean it up, and then put it into a slicer and have it come out of a low-cost machine. And when he graduated, he left behind a collection of of almost 100 molecules that are now in the library catalog. So you can check these out for your class or your research just like you would check out a book. And more and more we're doing that with ancient objects too. So we've uh, shared some cuneiforms from Colgate University and other partners where we'll digitize an object and share a physical collection rather than like a text collection. 
Uh, my favorite print that we've done uh, since I've been here, I've been here for six years. This is my favorite object. Uh, it's a vase from a tomb on Crete. And it took us two years just to get the intellectual property rights to physicalize this. So we scanned this in the Heraklion Museum three summers ago. And we've done a whole case study with this where we have this in a VR environment where you can pick it up. We have it in a HoloLens where you can place it in context as a hologram. Uh, we have it in a 3D PDF where you can take measurements in the publication of volumes and surfaces. And then we have the physical copy of the object done in the bio teaching labs, uh, mainly molecule printer. So now we're doing more ancient objects. Another really cool project is Helen's project. Helen, you want to tell them about what you did with this space? Hey, hi. Um, so this is uh, an Egyptian um, droplet from uh, a tomb we found in uh, like close to Cairo. And one of the really cool things about this was that we didn't know whether or not it was a grave good that was used uh, in real life or just something that was buried from people to use in the afterlife. So we used um, high fidelity 3D scanning to look for um, wear marks on the handle of the object. And we found that there were, yeah, like there were significant remarks on um, each of them, except for one, which we um, actually ended up uh, tying back to the infant. So we did end up concluding that this was used in real life and it wasn't just a great good uh, for use in the afterlife. Uh, so Helen is our student manager of the space and helps people get started with a lot of these tools and is gonna help us put about 10 more high-end computers. One of the things in all of our spaces is we have custom PCs. So. Uh, our student workers build and maintain custom hardware systems so we can move a little faster, upgrade them. They last a little longer. And like all of this emerging tech, like the video cards don't last a four year standard refresh cycle. And this way we can get under the hood a little bit more. So we're gonna standardize on this type of build and put a bunch more machines in here. Uh, I thought we could sit down too. So a couple other things that we're not showing. There's a machine room we could walk down to. We have two laser cutters that are not out in public. So all of our three public spaces, we've put tools that are safe, that people can't get too in trouble with. Uh, but we do offer laser cutting as a service. We also offer drones as a service. So it's really pilots as a service where we're not gonna just hand you a drone and say, good luck. We'll hand you a pilot, we'll file a flight plan. We have FAA licensing, we'll help you get it if you don't. Uh, and we can also do the insurance. So a lot of times we're not touching it, but we're there and we're making it all insured and legal. Uh, also some other cool projects. We've worked with a bunch of the sports teams. Uh, this is a ski from the ski team. This is a slalom guard that a racer actually competed with for a whole season, which is why it's so banged up. They're going to iterate on that design this year. Um, and I wanted to show off our biggest stuff. So those cheap $500 printers uh, can print 15 inches tall. This is a 70 hour print on that, uh, about the maximum build volume we can do in the library today. Uh, this is a seven hour print. So with those E3D hot ends, you can quick swap the nozzles out to like a one millimeter nozzle, print one millimeter layers. So 10 times fast, 70 hours for the uh, 200 microns, seven hours for the 1000 microns. So we have two hackathons a year. And in a 24 hour design contest, you can't build something this big at full res because you don't have enough time. So we had to find ways to accelerate that and get people to like human scale prototyping in a smaller amount of time. And some of this like a, uh, we have this giant benchy in Quantum Flex, so a giant squishy benchy. It does not float. Uh, and this is another project I really like. Uh, we have a professor here who uh, is doing custom cello software. So he writes software code that creates cello shapes. And so uh, he hand makes amazing cellos, uh, but we're helping him play with some of his prototypes before he actually makes them. So that's a, a wood filament print. And for bigger stuff, we've partnered with some other labs in the Boston area. So you can prototype in plastic, and if you need to go to bigger scale, we can find somewhere else to partner with. So I thought Tim and I could sit down now, and if you have any questions, we could run through questions. Uh, if there are other projects you're interested in, we could also show some pictures or something. Oh my goodness, um, that was awesome. Okay, I already have a question. Well, Amy asked a question um, about, she says 1,200 square feet, question mark. So if you could go over the space sizes of sure space and what they are collectively, I guess, again. And then I have another question on here, which you guys can probably see, which is, um, do you push to GitHub in addition to the in-house documentation? So for the square footage, the main uh, digital fabrication space, the maker lab with that uh, teal wall, that's about 600 square feet. Uh, mm -hmm. The new automation space is about 400 square feet. And this room's about 400 square feet. So it's around 1,200, 1,300 uh, square feet discontinuous space in pockets throughout the building and sort of we've grown this organically so there wasn't like a strategy it was 
as the tools were used and the classes and the researchers were there, we moved from each space. And I should mention, our group started off as a research technology group. So our first clients were the 35 or so research labs on campus and the instrumentation in those labs. And we started that in 2012 and really built good research partnerships, but we couldn't break into student life or coursework. So it was actually a student undergraduate who funded the first printers, uh, Noah Fram Schwartz. He ran a printer in his dorm room for 3,000 hours in the fall semester in 2013. Uh, There's only like 3,500 hours. And at the time there was a rep 2 Gen 4, the MK2 drive gear on the Replicator 2, uh, <laughs> which was a great printer before the smart extruders. Mm -hmm. uh, he figured out a way to do two materials out of a single nozzle based on offset and melting, so they really fused and it looked really clean. Uh, Brie Pettis invited him out to the printer farm and he did a whole tour and got a bunch of promotional photos. And Noah was incredible at fundraising and marketing. So I couldn't get $100 for a single printer at the time. I was pitching to anyone that would listen. Uh, the Bitmap Club connected me to Noah uh, we became his advisor, helped him charter the 3D printing club, and as a freshman through the allocations board, he got $20,000 to buy 3D printers with, which was unheard of. We've never had technology funded anything like that here. Uh, so with that, we had the printers and we had an argument to get space. So that was our foot to get space. So we started in research, moved to student life. At the end of that year, his freshman year, Noah was poached by Google, went and did fabrication stuff for Google. Then he started a, a Y Commentator follow fellowship. He's on his like third startup. He's probably not coming back. <laughs> but we've learned a lot from these people that have gone on and been very like vigorous doing stuff. Uh, and now we're slowly getting back from student life into coursework. So we're working more with courses for credit. Uh, I'm teaching a course for credit at the business school. And we're trying to integrate these workflows across the curriculum. There's a big push for digital literacy locally and a big push for design thinking. And we can hook into that in almost any discipline. Uh, yeah, so the next question, uh, do we push to GitHub in addition yeah. to the in-house documentation? Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, we actually initially started with using the GitHub wiki pages and found that the Dazuki guides, because of the way that you can uh, link the individual pictures and their step-by-step -step and all that good stuff, just lent itself better to a step-by-step -step style guide. Um, if we're going to do basically a big readme, then that'll probably still live on a GitHub wiki page. Um, and then the actual sample code that we're doing for any of those individual things will be put on GitHub and then linked to from the Dazuki. So that's still very much a, a work in progress. Most of the guides that we have built are still private uh, because we don't want to release something that's not ready for actual consumption yet, like hasn't been vetted, you know, checked. Um, and you so, started building these this summer. Yes, yeah, this is brand new. Okay. Cool. So as you can see, the next question there is, how are you all funded, which we got a little bit of history on, but I'd say for all the spaces, and how did you drive the demand? Is it top-down administration support? If so, why? Which again, we heard a little bit about, but if you could talk to you, I guess, all of the spaces. Definitely. How you got to where you are now. Yes, so our, our central budget is the library budget. So our salaries, our OPEX, and our CAF comes from the library. We've had huge institutional support. But we founded this in a merged library technology organization. And a year and a half, two years ago, the library and technology group separated and we went with the library side. Uh, partially because our work feels a lot more like library work than like IT work. Um, and with that, we're not, we don't have huge capital budgets. We have uh, relatively small capital budgets. So a lot of this, we help other groups pursue grants or funding through alternate sources. Um, and it's very much a bottom-up, customer-driven acquisition. Uh, at Brandeis, the students have a huge amount of autonomy. So our model is mainly based on getting these hands into the tools of subject matter experts. So there, there is no engineering program on campus, no physical engineering. We have a liberal arts college and a R1 research university smushed together with no engineering in the middle. So we provide the engineering tools to the community. And a lot of the time, we can help them pursue local grants or national grants or something in their program. So we can, we do a lot of proof of concept where we help you get started, uh, we'll do your one-off, and then after that, if we wanna make it sustainable, how can we get this funding every year? Right, that huge machine quantity and huge machine diversity is as a result of, of projects requiring a particular specialty set of, of gear or a particular student or group of students wanting to try some neat innovative thing, some, some better way of trying to do a printing thing. And a lot of that was the 3D printer club driving those. And so uh, 
as staff, we haven't, we've almost, the first printers we bought, and we were like, these are the right printers to buy. But since that first round in 2014, it's always been, what are you trying to do? How can we get a tool that'll help you get where you want to get? We're not really driving that. We're letting our customers drive that. That's great. Um, I had a brief question myself. Um, so as I was noting before we started this call, we're in the process of potentially building your robotics lab down the line. Um, I'm curious about the, the different robots that you guys uh, have that you showed off and sure. the supercomputer Pi. Uh, with those projects that you found, how did, how did you find those different projects to sort of start as your baseline for um, building, you know, introducing students to robotics? And then my other question, given that you guys don't have an engineering department, as you noted, then my other question to that is you mentioned briefly about the components that you have in that space. I'm curious, um, you mentioned that you might loan those out. Um, how does that system work? Or is it more that students who have an actualized project that come into that space to use those things, they use them, they build something, maybe that thing then lives on in that space once they leave, or how do you manage sort of the parts and components side of uh, that space? Sure, so let's start at the beginning. Um, a lot of the, the backstory of why that space even exists is we have a, a computer science professor who is teaching a robotics course. And so the whole idea is he's trying to build this uh, campus rover project where you can put a package on a bot and have it move from his office down two buildings away down the hill up to my office. Mm. And it will autonomously navigate that whole path and not run anybody over and not get stuck and all that good stuff, right? Which is on paper, like, okay, that's pretty significant. But then if you actually go do the research in industry, that's an impossible quest like that can't be done today uh, basically unless you are Google you know or, or uh, Amazon or something like even even those huge companies are not doing this kind of project so it really is full deep dive for these students doing awesome awesome work um, and they get to really figure all of this stuff out well so this is uh, some sort of demand from faculty and then we noticed that uh, there were several different research groups uh, the major one in particular is probably oh, yeah, we got to plug in, sorry. Um, the major one that comes to mind is the Ashton Gravia Lab. So they do uh, uh, spatial orientation and vestibular research. And they um, have been heavy users of the, the 3D printing aspect of the Maker Lab and were very interested also in doing more uh, vestibular supplementation to a human. So they actually had a high school group come in and they were working on this uh, vibration necklace that had an accelerometer and gyro board that would uh, belt to your chest. And if you were leaning forward, it would vibrate in the front of the neck. And if you were leaning backwards, it would vibrate in the back of the neck. And so now they could do other vestibular tests with things like that. For example, if you are on your back, you all of a sudden it shuts off your vestibular system because all of the, the hairs and the liquids and stuff don't align and your body like gets no input and you just don't, have any sort of learning progress. Well, what if you supplement that with physical touch? Um, do you get any different sorts of results? Uh, another one is if you play with headphones, uh, a sweeping or a circular auditory sound and your eyes are closed, oftentimes people will start to like twist and fall over, they get dizzy. Um, does that still happen if you have this supplement? You know, if you can, and so what they're trying to play with there is, is can you hold two different vestibular states for things like going to Mars or being out of sp outer space for any sort of reason, things like that. So that, that's actually a good differentiator. So uh, when we explain this, especially to local people, almost all our tools are sci-fi because they're not studying engineering, but they're subject matter experts that can take an engineering tool and go really far. And one of our analogies we like to use is like, MIT is gonna build the rocket that goes to Mars, right? Like they're that type of environment. And uh, our, our, our spatial orientation lab is a neuroscience and psychology lab. So more what Brandeis will contribute is how do we put a human on that rocket for three years and have them not be super uncomfortable the whole time? And how do we ever get them back into earth gravity after? So, um, and then, so that's, that's kind of like where this lab came from. There is actually demand on campus, though on paper it doesn't seem like there should be. Um, and what's interesting is it's not just computer science students, researchers, faculty, et cetera in there. We've got, I'm actually working on a project right now for a math faculty. Um, we have interest in the International Business School. There's the uh, RAB 
continuing uh, graduate professional studies group is working with us. And this is all a totally brand new lab. Um, just on the robotics. Just, side. yeah, just that aspect, mm -hmm. just the automation lab. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, so as for the renting of stuff, we're treating it no different than renting of a book. So you will come in and so the, the example I really like to use is a distance sensor, for example. So there's a couple different ways you can measure distance. One is LIDAR and you measure the beam's angle as it reflects back off of another object and that's with some trig you can get distance. Um, the other option is you use ultrasonic and so you shoot out a sonar wave, it bounces off a thing, we know the speed of sound, we measure how long it takes for that pulse to come back and then now you've got your distance. Well, your LIDAR is much, much more accurate and consistent. Your ultrasonic gets wonky every so often and it's not a pinpoint accuracy, you get a conal shape. So if you've got a pole in your way, your actual distance is whatever your closest thing that bounces back or not. Sometimes it just gets weird. Um, that said, LiDAR doesn't work if you are outside and it's a really, really bright day because it doesn't see the beam bounce back. So now you've got this gotcha where you're like, oh, well, I definitely want this, you know, price isn't a problem. I definitely want this higher accuracy, more consistent uh, sensor. And then you go put the thing on your robot and, oh, by the way, your robot is outdoors and now it doesn't work if it's high noon. Um, and that happens all the time with all kinds of different sensors. You just, you can see these issues on paper, but until you have it in your actual hands, it's very hard to see the difference. Um, so for the researchers, for the, anybody who's using this kind of stuff, they can actually take the physical object themselves. And at least, we don't have every sensor in the world, obviously, but we've got a, a wide variety of at least like that avenue. So I don't have, you know, the greatest LiDAR sensor in the entire universe, but I've got a LiDAR sensor, you know, a version that uses that style tech. So you can try that and say, either I definitely want this one and they'll backfill our equipment, you know, put it on the bot backfill our equipment, or they'll say, yes, I definitely want to pursue this avenue now I've tested that I know. Does that answer the question at all? Yes, somewhat. I guess my other part of the question was, so you have so, um, the, the roving vehicle, the little robots that hit each other out of the track. Yes. How did you find those particular projects as well? Right. Um, right. I'm just curious about that because we have, we have invested in turtle bots, for example, right now. Yes. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just curious about how you guys found out about those totally. particular tools. So the, the, the campus rover actually, the foundation bots we're using for those is yep. uh, the turtle bots. Uh, mm -hmm. The other one, okay. their lower level is uh, the M bots. They're like a little Arduino kit that's mm -hmm. uh, just lower level and they're cheap, mm -hmm. which is nice. Little mm -hmm. blue ones. Um, the donkey car, I just found looking online generally. Okay. There was no like intended find there. Um, the uh, combat robotics was, uh, we have a partnership with, uh, well, I guess it's not a partnership. There's a, a local maker area called Artisan's Asylum mm -hmm. uh, where you come in, you rent a bench, you do cool stuff. It's uh, basically what we're trying to do, but public oriented instead of uh, like inside of the university. Um, and they offer workshops and all kinds, kinds of good stuff. And they have a combat robotics thing. Uh, and one of the aspects of that combat robotics is the sumo bots. And that is actually under our robotics club. So like Ian mentioned, uh, we house a lot of the different clubs. One of the clubs that is housed in the automation lab is the robotics club. So they're working on that. They're also working on a project called InMove. We found InMove that's a, a, an upper torso, full upper torso of a human uh, that is 3D printed, fully open source. You can manipulate objects. It's got servos and all of the fingers, all that good stuff. Um, and we found that at the Boston Maker Fair. Um, so I wish I could give you just like a, we found all of them here, but it's, it's from everywhere and from all of the things. Mm -hmm. I would also, uh, there's a thing we're not doing here, which is uh, our community has gotten really enthusiastic about drone applications. And we can't, uh, we can't turn on a propeller on campus without public safety okaying it. So uh, there is a ban locally, but people build the robots and then go somewhere else to operate them. And uh, so Tim and I have each built over 50 racing drones Jesus. in the last three years as a hobby at home, which we didn't come to Brandeis with a drone agenda. We didn't do anything with this before we were here, but we saw people using stuff like this and it sort of became personal cross training projects where we can go home and build something and we learn some printing, some fabric, some fabrication, some signals, uh, like PID control. How does control theory work? 
right? I, I didn't have an engineering background. I'm a Brandeis undergrad from 2005, and I studied economics and philosophy here. <laughs> and, I, and then I worked at a jeweler, and I learned most of my technique in industry. Uh, the jeweler 3D printed everything they made. So I, a lot of, we kind of fell into this lifestyle where we're in a community, that project seems cool, we do it at home, and then some of that comes into work, some of that doesn't. So a lot of this has been community building as much as tech skills building. Yeah. I guess I, I made the donkey car finding online sound accidental, but really it's just obsession. Well, and, and there was a model. <laughs> so when we opened the Maker Lab, we, a bunch of prints we did without a customer. So like, like this print, no one ordered this. We were like, we need a big showpiece that we can put at tables, put out in the library and drive traffic. Yeah. When Tim was starting the automation lab this summer, a lot of it was, can we think of three to six projects that will inspire people and sort of make this tangible? And maybe they're not going to build that project, but it's a gateway to machine learning or a gateway to sensors or gateway to data viz. So one, one major thing I, I skipped over, actually, uh, now that he's reminding me, is we have on the ceiling in that automation lab, there's a whole bunch of post-it notes. And each one of those post-it notes is representative of what will be a PIR sensor, a passive infrared sensor. It's the same kinds of sensors you have in the corners of your house for a security system or the uh, automatic lights on the front of the garage door. Um, so it, it notices a large mass of heat move and humans happen to be a large moving mass of heat. Uh, so it's a human sensor. And so we have uh, a whole array of those or we'll have a whole array of those on the ceiling and each one of those is intentionally blinded to about six foot diameter and they're ever so slightly overlapping. And with that, now we can track where people are moving around and using the room so that we can do things like uh, efficiency uh, uh, room layout optimization. So yeah. that's a relatively small room with large demand. So we can't really be wasting space. If we find out that, you know, not many people are using this computer station, but everybody's using these soldering stations, then maybe we need an extra soldering station and one less computer station, that kind of deal. Um, it's also a good microcosm for itself because now we can take that same data and do something fun with the data, machine learning, whatever, and dump it back out as something. So it shows like, this is what the room is for. Data in, do something cool with it, data out. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that's great. <laughs> and, and as part of this is like, we're looking at Brandeis culture. We're looking at what inspires people in that context. You know, we're, we're founded on a mission of social justice. And we don't say social justice as much. We try to say social good or find a way that it connects with people. But even our hackathons are almost always uh, our first nine hackathons that we ran were always targeted at a, solving a disability or helping someone with a problem in your community. And now we're working with, there's about 25 nonprofits in Waltham and we're taking their actual challenges and having kids hack around that. So a lot of it's like the enable project was the first thing we saw. We were like, people will do this. This has enough STEM, but enough human side that this will inspire people. And that's different for every other school. Like what's the local flavor and culture and how can you find projects that will inspire that? That's great. Amy, I see you're on. Did you have any questions? Nope. <laughs> I have a lot. I'm just like in this zone of, I feel like we've interviewed a bunch of places that are private universities that have this social justice, social good um, bent towards it. And I always am struggling with how do we adapt that here in the public university, right? So I serve, we are a very small group of people and staff and students are majority of that, right? So we have eight students that um, fuel it and then we have probably 10 volunteer students and then maybe 10 people who are like emeriti faculty or like community members that are just like, we love this place, I hang out here and help. And then there's like me and one staff member, right? And I, I guess... I, every time I see something this inspirational, I'm like, yes, this is where I want to be. But how, I don't know how to roll it out to a public institution, right? So, like, um, this is my current, like, struggle. Like, how do I get there? I also want to say, and so it's, I don't really know if there, there's a question in there, but, like, you probably can't imagine what that's like. But I, somehow I would love to work with you all moving forward. It's you yeah. all at Brandeis in particular, like, how can we get this to work in the public, in the public institutional, institutional <laughs> yeah because i get you I i'm like you. i'm like pushing 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 right mm -hmm. but there's like um it just feels like it's going to take a lot longer and i think so university of michigan is up there yeah. they exist for the public good right and so i look to them all the time like how do we get this how do we get this here at boise state now 
I'm in Idaho, the context is completely different. I don't have Artisans of Silence, Asylum like out the back door. We have, when I first started doing this, we were the first makerspace in town. Now there's like 10 makerspaces in town, right? So like we're starting and I feel like we're predisposed for it. However, we're, we're still struggling. We can't graduate people. Um, our students, they come in and they're, I know you talked a little bit about digital fluency, but they're really struggling with digital fluency. Like sometimes, even last week I had a student, like they had never navigated multiple tabs before, right? And they're trying to learn how to program something. So I'm curious if you can speak to that in terms of, um, I don't know, I hope that's a fair question. It might not yeah. be a fair question because you probably no, don't have the either. answers I either. Is. I think about that a lot. And like, okay. it's sort of like that thing, like the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And like, if we don't democratize these tools, they're the power, we need all these different perspectives to solve all these problems. So we really need to make the access like flat. And one of the things for us that we've been really lucky for is we have a zero chargeback model. So there's no charge for filament or anything. Instead, we take pictures. Same. But maybe there's a way to like leverage something around. If you walk up, you can pay for things. I think the way that you fund a makerspace, we say this all the time, is by selling soda. Right, you put a coffee shop in your makerspace and run it You're 24 right. seven, that's money. Because when you get hearts and minds and bodies in this space, it's how do we, like the money isn't the machines, it's the consumption that you're going through while you're there. Uh, and I think there's a couple different models. Uh, we were pitched hard by MIT to be a fab lab from the beginning. The reason we didn't go to the fab consortium is because we don't have the parking where we couldn't open to the public. <laughs> and we couldn't put that dangerous set of tools in our library. Uh, we see. Uh, we've seen some other spaces that have been by doing more of that chargeback, big tools, open access model. Uh, but I also think like finding hooks, like little consumable things. And the robotics club is a good example of that. Like those, those mini sumo robots for combat robotics. Uh, a lot of these, no one here builds robots really other than when they start working with us or if they come with like, they came from a first team now. A lot of these kids yeah. learn more CAD in high school than we have courses here for. Uh, so finding a platform that, oh, you just do code, you wanna write Python, here's a robot that's ready for you. Like the chassis is built. A lot of the faculty mm -hmm. are coming to us asking for the kit. Like we're gonna do software in our class, can you provide the hardware that we can hack with? Uh, we also have had a lot of luck doing hackathons. Uh, so we had the first 24 hour 3D printing hackathon in higher ed, and that brand grew and it got really popular. But alongside it, that's like a high barrier. You have to come and operate a printer and kind of like, a lot of people are upstarting in that first 24 hours. So we started a parallel brand with student agency called Code Stellation, uh, which will happen this November for the fifth or sixth time? I think it's sixth, yeah. And it's a low barrier to entry inclusive hack event targeted at people that don't self-define as hackers. And there's a high school division. So any student, high school, undergrad, graduate, PhD, whatever, can come and you're rewarded for trying a tool you've never tried before. So no matter what, what, do, you, level of what do you call that again? What did you call that one? The that one's Code Stellation. CodeStellation.io. When is it? Can I come? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. November 11th. We'd love to have you guys. Okay. Uh, and send your students. But I think uh, like if you guys had events, we would send our students there too. And the hook for us has been generating these communities. Really like we're not the advocates. The students and the faculty are really the advocates. Yes. So we also another hack. Uh, we do at least once a semester, we do an event for faculty kids on, on like a Saturday. And then those kids become our evangelists for the next year. Wait, faculty uh, the children of faculty? Of faculty, yeah. Yeah. So they can bring the their families in and they can do uh, like Tinkercad, scan yourself, make an object. I need we'll like it. another hour conversation with you just to digest yeah. this section that you're describing of your, Ooh. I like to call it grippy, the grippy things, yeah. right? These are the things that like people can, when they, ha they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like we still have people who are like hacking. That's scary. Who does that? Yeah. yeah. Like. I'm looking at your website, Code Stellation, the friendly hackathon. And I'm like, I need to, ha I want to like, just take all of these things that you're doing and I just want to bring them here. <laughs> That's so, when you're yeah. open source. <laughs> you do the design. Can, can <laughs> keep talking. So, we're talking <laughs> at a business school, but how do we market? Because we're not marketing professionals, but we do what? some. So like, this is our marketing for Dice Hacks. And we have hackers, makers, scientists, tinkerers, thinkers, artists. So we made these multimodal marketings where you see hacker, maybe I'm not a hacker. You see, maybe I'm not a maker. You see like artists, like maybe I am an artist. And then like, then it looks back and you're like, maybe I'm also a hacker. So we're trying to inception the community a little bit. But we're also another great hack. Uh, we print little containers and put them at every service point on campus. So our career center, our student services have little pen holders. 
And it's sort of like people are sort of touching prints and seeing fabrication, and it's sort of luring them in a little bit. It becomes less sci-fi when you're interacting with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Um, okay. The thing we don't have yet that I would love to talk to other people about is how we get in high-level institutional support. So uh, provost, president, capital campaign level. We need a physical space yeah. uh, that's continuous, and I don't know how we'll ever fund that. That's the next level that we don't know how to do. That's something I've been working really hard on and at Boise State, and I have the support for it at this point. And um, I would say that that has been taking advantage of a lot of the other people who are the ev evangelist oh, advocates. I can't say yeah, it today, yeah. sorry. Um, those people tell the story for you and then it eventually, but you have to get to the right people, right? So you, yep. people mm -hmm. who are in charge of space on campus, you have to get, in touch with them and they have to understand your vision and what your mission is and then they'll they'll repeat it right and then the people who are in charge of safety on campus okay so we have those people they all believe in us um so then you have to get like a few more deans and then they have to understand the mission the vision and they have to believe in you but i yep. feel like the more that you can be like yeah see we're not just here for making for the sake of making which is where yep. the barrier comes in they're just like whatever you're just playing with stuff and you're like no actually look i just worked with a bunch of homeless teens and they just built this robot yeah. and then they're like wait what are you doing um and that just getting in the room with those folks and talking to them, that's how that gets done. We had a presidential search last year and it failed actually. Our presidential search failed and I won't get wow. into the political reasons for that, but yeah. the person who the State Board of Education ended up making the offer to believed in making. So we had our students in all of those and they asked these questions. I didn't I didn't prompt them to do it. They did this on their own. And the only, there was only one person who actually was able to answer that question. We made the offer to this person. They declined because they didn't think there was going to be enough funding to help Boise State get to the next level. This was all in the papers, so I'm not telling you all anything. Yes. I'm not, this is nothing secret. But I had to tell the students, hey, did you know there this, there's this opportunity for you to speak up, right? Yep. And so that's what your job is, is to be like, hey, hey students, there's these opportunities to go speak up. I would love for you to go. And frequently what they say is, oh, that's not for me. And you're like, wait, no, no, students are welcome. Or no, your staff, you're welcome, just come. And then you just help them. You make them practice, like what questions you want to ask. And that's the way I've done it. So I don't know that we're about to, I mean, I feel like there's an offer for us to have a space of our choosing at this time, um, but we have to like work on it. Like, what do we want that space to be? And what do we yeah. really need? So We've been in a leadership transition too and waiting for a new strategic plan. And really over the last year and a half, two years, being in the library under Matthew Sheehy's group in the Brandeis Library has been amazing for us. Like the support we get there, the connection to other experts. Uh, we, we wouldn't have had these spaces without Matthew in the library. So uh, we sort of did that in the first level of leadership. And now as the capital campaign gets defined and the new strategic plan, we have to go up to the next level. So it's really good to hear that it's possible. Mm -hmm. I also yeah. never wait for the strategic plan. I like help. You know, I don't wait for that. I like help build it, but I don't know. Boise State's a weird university. We don't have levels of uh, hierarchy. We're like super entrepreneurial. It's a really strange environment. So I always like forge ahead, even without a strategic plan in place. So we that's need my to talk advice. more. <laughs> I think there's a lot to share. Yeah, Yay! Here at Plymouth, I mean, we're lucky too. We had we brought in a new president. I started two years ago, but we brought in a new president three years ago that has an engineering background, I believe, and so it was very supportive of all of these things. We don't have an engineering department, but we just started a robotics and electromechanics program as part of computer science. So with that, the expectation then becomes, okay, we're going to have a robotics lab. Okay. Um, another thing that happened here, which is also a public institution, part of a public institutional problem, but also part of restructuring, we took away our departments and we're building what has been called clusters. Hmm. So it's integrated departments without deans, basically. Cool. Um, and that means that collaboration becomes more a part of the institutional culture period. Yep. And it's been problematic in some ways, but with part of that, we now have what's called an arts and technologies cluster. That's oh, amazing. Wow. And what that means is that my coworker who's been, I'm more of the people side of the making. I came from a public library maker space. So I'm designing more of the, the student training and that side of things. My coworker who's doing a lot more of the build out has gone to all of these meetings with the arts and technologies cluster and has asked, what do we need? What can we make happen? How can it support? How can I support you? So we've got 
the EMTR folks, as we like to call them, electro whatever and robotics and arts. So we're mm -hmm. building in our, what was traditionally an arts gallery. We're taking and previously, you know, a hundred years ago was a factory and taking that space and building a maker space in it because we have support from the arts we already had tools yeah. that are part of that so, cool. so and then we also have the the robotic stuff which is starting to happen so the space that we're building has to at least initially support some of the robotics and some of the arts and that is kind of what we're going for and we're just lucky we came about at the right time yep new hampshire struggles our big struggle has been um funding we're yep the 50th funded state in terms of public higher education. Ooh, wow. So yeah, we're last. Um, New Hampshire's don't, New Hampshire it's don't like taxes. I don't yeah. have any income tax, um, which is good for me, but bad for other things, right? So we struggle with sort of the budgeting and financial investment side of things, which I don't have as much background on. I just know we've got people that support us, support us and that's how we've gotten this far. Yep. Um, oh, I, it's that, great to hear all these different tactics, though. It, make, it gives hope to all of us. <laughs> yeah. With that, it's 201. So I don't want to keep anyone that's on here any longer. Unless anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. I, see what I have one question. Okay. If I came to visit, my sister lives in Montpelier, Vermont. She just moved, and I'm supposed to go visit. And um, if I came to visit, could I come hang out with you all? Absolutely. For, yeah, we, can, we can give you full awesome. tours, try all, kick all the tires. We can go fly some drones. Thank you. Uh, if anyone else wants a tour or to come hang out with us, makerlab at brandeis.edu is our shared email. And if you let us know 24 hours in advance, we can usually make something happen. Okay. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, I see there's other folks on the call. They know who to email. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and end it because we've hit past two o'clock. But thank you for compacting all of those spaces and all of that information within an hour. We greatly appreciate it. We can't wait to watch the YouTube. Yes. All right. Thank you all. Have Thanks. a good day. You too.